Welcome back to Church Unscripted, a ministry of Brookside Church where we intend to go deeper into the conversations we're having on Sunday morning. We're so glad you joined us today. And as always, if you find value in this podcast, we're gonna ask that you subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already. Make sure you like this channel as well and then share it so that you and all your friends uh, can be a part of these uh, conversations as well. So today is a little bit different where it's a little bit more crowded up here. And so I have with us uh, Pastor David Johnson, our worship pastor, John Mueller, as well as Luke Chappelle. And so thanks, fellas, for joining us today. Um, I'm wondering if it's all right if I try to summarize your message from this weekend and tell me if I'm accurate or inaccurate, and then let's go from there. Can we do that? Is this like a game? This like is a this. game show. It's a buzz, I mean, I, unscripted I, game show. I think all three of you should do it, and then I'll just pick which one was most accurate. How about we all we, do it at we'll the same like time, and you just tell us which one sounded better? That's fine. Now, how about I start? Yeah, you go Okay, yeah. <laughs> sounds good. So uh, you were in Luke chapter 10 uh, this week, and and it was, it was a, I thought, appreciated this. A good follow-up from last week where we introduced what Jesus did in chapter nine with his 12 apostles where he sent them out. Um, and like you said, in chapter 10, there's almost a verbatim uh, account of how he didn't mm-hmm. send out this time the 12 apostles, but the 70 or 72 others based upon your translation. And then as you worked your way through Jesus' kind of instruction message to them, I kind of categorized the different parts of it. The first thing was the sending. Okay. That's in the verses one through three or four or something like that, right? Yep. And then after that, before they would leave, he kind of um, he kind of gave them conditions. He went from the sending to, uh, what's my word here? He went from ascending to uh, talking about the potential um, difficulties that they're going to face along the way. Yep. Uh, He also gave them instructions on what to do when they face those kind of adversaries, those Mm -hmm. those difficulties. But then he went into a period of of talking about rejection. So it's not just enough to to have adversaries, whether that's a people or a system or whatever. It's when you feel rejected, I mean, what do you do? And from that point on, he he transitioned into more of a perspective-based conversation mm-hmm. where he said, you know what? If they listen to you, then they're listening to me. If they reject you, they're going to reject me and not just me, but the one who sent me. So mm. I feel like that was an encouragement that they needed to recognize this is not their mission. This is God's mission. It's his words. It's his purpose that he's simply entrusting to them to do. And I think from all of that, the very last thing was the motivation to go. Um, yep. And so, I don't know, give me, give me a, a one through 10. How accurate was uh, that? Yeah, I'll take that as a, as, as a 10 at least. Uh, I appreciate that. I mean, that. like, uh, if you got that out of what I said, I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd be surprised. I mean, That's that was, that was got, better man. than what I said. So no, no, you did a great just job. Took a whole, you know, I spent... 10 minutes longer than I was supposed to. Uh, and you 15, just, and you yeah, just, yeah, or 15 yeah. longer than I was supposed to. <laughs> there's forgiveness. Um, yeah. There's forgiveness for that. Is that, is that how that works? Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, that was, yeah, really well done. Well, I appreciate that. I'm glad you listened. Yeah, I pre- So, so here's my first question. <laughs> I was intently listening. Okay, I know you said through that's twice. right. I was, I was raptured attention. So, so my first question is about the sending part. Okay. So, uh, in your estimation, not just for you, but for all of us here, yeah. uh, what what percentage of our people not know that they were sent, but feel that they are sent, and really know what that looks like because they're sent? Whoa. What percent of our people? So, maybe not just so Brookside, maybe I, the church. Can I all. rephrase this question Please do. in the way that I, I think I'm hearing it? Please do. Um, and I probably won't do as good of a job as you did summarizing the sermon. Um, I guess what I hear you saying is when you, when you look out over the congregation, how many of the people that call Brookside home feel like this is part and parcel in their DNA? Yeah. yeah. Is, that, is that a fair way to That's a fair question. restate that? Yeah. Hmm. Wow, that's a that's so, a so that's a good question. There's really, I think there's two two parts to that. So you don't want me to answer? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I want to yeah. modify no, no. the question. We invited you on unscripted. We just don't want you to answer. I want to anything. modify the question because yeah. I think you're going to go in one way or another. So there's two things that I I hear when I hear that. I hear uh, uh, day by day by day, or sometimes they're sent. Does that make sense? Mm. Like I have to wake up in the morning, even as a pastor and say, I'm sent today. Wow. Does that make sense? Like you can't do that every day. So to, to quantify it and say, well, Mm. this, this amount of people are, 
are we saying all the time? Because I mean, in, in any in any case, I think yeah. there's really a spectrum. There's moments where I'm definitely not living scent with my kids, or I'm not <laughs> definitely not living scent with whatever. I'm just I'm just being honest. I mean, sure. Do you, do you see what I'm getting at? I think so. I think I think again, what I hear you saying is, how many of us live with this posture 24 mm seven, -hmm. and how of us how many of us actually live with this posture in oh I'm gonna go because we have this thing scheduled on Saturday and I'm committed to it and we're going to go minister to people, right? So it's less schedule and more lifestyle. Well, sure. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I like how you broke that down. Like, I think mm -hmm. that, I mean, do I think that, I, I, one of the pitfalls I think we get into is, and I don't want to totally squirrel on this topic, but I think one of the things that we get to is, there's both a blessing and a curse in sort of looking at the whole like spiritual giftedness around this. Like people think if I don't have the spiritual gift of evangelism, well, then I'm not called to this. Mm. I mean, and do we think the 72 all had that gift? Probably not. Okay. I mean, it doesn't say that they did. Again, that goes back to, maybe, you know, maybe. the comment of like, it maybe. doesn't mm -hmm. matter. But then he didn't, he didn't ask, how many of you have the gift of evangelism? Exactly. He just, you're also a disciple. Jesus, so. And so I think, yeah, right. but, he knew. <laughs> but I think sometimes, you know, if, if you grew up like I did in the church and you've taken these yeah. spiritual gift assessments, it's like, oh, good, I don't have the spiritual gift of no, evangelism. Right. right. I don't have to be that oh, guy. Oh, good, I don't. <laughs> well, no, I mean, like, I guarantee yeah, yeah. you there are people who feel that way. Yeah, sure. I'm not saying, yeah. you know, um, but like when I look over the congregation, I mean, simply put, I think that if we all lived that lifestyle, wow. we would have a church that was 10 times as bigger than it is. Hmm. Or we would have 10 Brookside churches all over Northeast Fort Wayne or mm -hmm. fill in the blank. Um, you know, does that mean we're all not doing our job? Well, I don't know, maybe. Yeah. Um, well, I think you gauged it pretty well by your opening right. scenario where you said, we're going to actually leave this space and go into our community. Mm -hmm. You could see people kind of begin to like <laughs> squirm so, a little bit. So I saw this flag today somewhere we were sitting. <laughs> a little bit of PTSD. <laughs> flag, and I was like, it's like, wait, 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 are we going on mission here right now? <laughs> but but yeah. I think, flag I think that, right. was a, that was an eye-opening thing, even for me. Like I knew it was coming because I right. read your manuscript. But when I read it, I was like, man, if, I, if I'm sitting there, what's my thought? Like, am I ready to go or am I like, uh, so oh, like, look at the how time. Can we slip out I need before to... we have to leave. Yeah. yeah. And I think that was, that was eye opening for me, right. even just in talking about this. So I think a high percentage of us know we're sent, but I don't think we feel it day to day. Well, I think that's part of the problem. I think the reason that some of us don't feel that we're sent is because we define being sent to going to places that we really don't want to go mm -hmm. um, into, into and, it's, and Jesus goes to these places, but we feel it's only defined by poverty areas and the sending is only give poor people food, right? Mm -hmm. But I think what Jesus is doing is he's setting the stage of, of because you're a follower of Jesus, I am sending you, but it's not always defined the same way. So you mm. said, I am being sent in my home as a parent and a husband. Mm. I'm being sent into my neighborhood as a good neighbor. Yeah. I'm being sent into my workplace. So I, I love what I heard um, from another pastor recently on a podcast. He said, um, wherever God, so like career wise, right? Mm -hmm. We're not all going to be missionaries or pastors, right. but that's how we kind of think that that's what mm, sending looks like. Yeah, right. But what if Jesus has sent some of us into the school system and not just like the Christian school system, mm -hmm. but like the bad school system, whatever that is, right? Yeah. What if God has sent us into an accounting kind of a role, right? Or a, or a, an actuary kind of role. So if you're an accountant doing people's taxes, you're being sent there, not just to do people's taxes, but to show people what it looks like when God counts what it looks like when God reconciles numbers. Hmm. When if you're going into, the, into a school system, you're not going into a school system to be a teacher. Hmm. You're going into a school system to show what it likes to raise children up, to not just be knowledgeable, but to be mature and strong. Hmm. So I think it's a matter of understanding, okay, hmm. where has God put me right now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And then how can I use that platform? Because hmm. I believe this, some people have a career that is outside God's will that does not serve God's purposes. Some people have the right career just serving the wrong kingdom. And so how do we make sure that our career is serving the right kingdom in the right way? And I think that's what it looks like to be sent. Um, there, there's one thing I noticed um, Luke had mentioned in the sermon that kind of pivots off that because I think people get discouraged or they quit. They maybe get to the point where you're at, Eric, where it's like everywhere you go, wherever God's put you, that's where you've been sent to. Um, you talked about the work being endless in, in 
in mm-hmm. verse two, mm-hmm. but in verse one, I found there was something that was actually more discouraging than verse two. That sounds okay. crazy, okay? But in verse one, you talked about working together. <laughs> and the discouraging thing about that is it said, sent them ahead of him two by two. How many of us are living sent in our jobs or careers or places we're at Ooh. and we're alone? Right. Wow. I mean, I could get emotional thinking about the times where I felt alone yeah. mm-hmm. and I was like, I'm the only one making a stand here. Mm. Um, I think of experiences uh, when I was working in social work and I realized I was the only person in my workplace that loved Jesus and wanted mm. to make sure that these it's kids tough. knew Jesus tough. loved them too. Yeah. Mm. And that's really hard. And so how many of us are in that space? Mm. And so I think, I mean, I don't know if this is really a discussion, but but why do you, we think it's so hard to find that other partner? Mm. It doesn't mean it's necessarily your spouse. It doesn't necessarily mean it's someone you work with. Mm. It could be someone that's just encouraging you while you're in your place that you're sent to. Mm. So I don't know if you guys have ideas about that. You know, I'm that. confident that, that if, if God knows your needs, he knows your desires. And if you spend some time praying for that, he said, God, he said I, God I need you to send somebody mm. to partner with me in this area. Mm. And I think mm. he has the ability to bring somebody in your path. And you were like, oh, that's the perfect well, fit. And, and then- the other piece of that puzzle is bringing someone alongside you is very like anti-current culture. Yeah. It's, you mean admitting weakness and vulnerability in front of people? No, I mean like thinking, <laughs> I, mean, not but I mean, like if we, if we look at, I mean, everything in our culture is, oh, get rich quick, right? Here's what you need to do. Here's your 10 steps to success. Here's, and at nowhere are they like, oh, find a good business partner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, you don't say that. <laughs> don't share your wealth. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, yeah, trade secrets, all the. Our yeah. culture is actually feeding us. Hey, go do it. You can make it happen all by wow. yourself. Self-made man, exactly. Yeah, but there's also like false community with social media, sure. where we can be surrounded. Like I have a friends list of a thousand people, and I maybe know <laughs> not even half of them well. <laughs> right. You know, it's like. We 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 feel like maybe we're with somebody, but really that that's just out to actually drive us further apart mm-hmm. because there's that comparison and stuff. So I yeah. think there's even that that we have a hard time actually walking with people because we think we're walking with people through other forms of media. Yeah, so. and and I I do think like we crowd out the sending. So like Eric, as you described sending, I thought to myself that could be very hard if you're by yourself. Mm-hmm. And so like when I hear this two by two, even Jesus, Jesus himself sent out his disciples two by two. He didn't send them out on their own. Yeah. And so like that just says something to me. That's a principle that I think we really need to follow as believers, realizing that either if we're someone with us, you know, going with us, right. or if it's someone that like, yeah. hey, we find another believer we can pray with at our workplace. Well, that same pattern extended into the book of Acts. I mean, mm-hmm. Paul and Barnabas went out and then it was Barnabas and John Mark and then Paul and Timothy, Paul and Titus. And so I, I think the pattern is that if you're doing intense ministry, especially around wolves, then you're an easy target. Mm. And that actually leads me to my next question, Luke. So okay. I loved how you pointed out that Jesus said, we are like lambs. Um, what did it say? He's sending us out like lambs among wolves. So why would a lamb willingly go to a place surrounded by wolves? Hmm. I mean, because it trusts the shepherd. He leads me beside still waters. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> he restores my soul. There's no other reason to so do it. So you have to trust your shepherd. Yeah. Hmm. So what kind of lambs, or not lambs, what kind of wolves, I mean, going into the adver- adversity part of your message, yeah. what kind of wolves can the church expect to encounter <laughs> as lambs being sent into those environments? Jeez, I mean, I, I, I mean, two things come to mind. One, look at church history, look at what it's encountered. I mean, everything up to death. Like, I don't know, I don't know how else to right. put that. Um, it's that simple. Um, it's, it's sort of why, you know, at the end of the sermon, I was like, what do you need to lay at the feet of Jesus? What's holding you back? Yeah. Um, you know, is that your career? Is that family? Is it whatever, whatever yeah. it is, um, what are you willing to sacrifice for the kingdom? Mm. Um, and then I think the second part to that, so you, you were, you were, you know, following the shepherd, blah, blah. Sorry, what was, 
What kind of left wolves? That's right. What kind of wolves do we experience today in and, as and lambs? I, and I think the other piece is, man, some of it's our own. I mean, there's wolves within the church. Mm-hmm. I mean, just in our own walls, and whether we want to admit it or not. Not at Brookside, though. Yeah, so, so, not at Brookside. So in the New Testament, the, the scariest thing about the wolves in the church is uh, New Testament talks about, and I think it's First Peter says, those who have been deceived are deceiving others. Right. So the scary thing is it's a ladder. Uh, those wolves don't even know they're wolves. Well, they're just like, and, they're not, th- there's no intent behind it. I mean, they're not like take, take it to the understanding. Ex- take it to the extreme of Judas, right? Yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, if you want to, you can go, okay, Judas betrayed Jesus. That's one out of 12, and I'm not saying it's direct math here, but a little less than 10% mm. might be betrayers. Mm. And yet, again, and we didn't talk about this yesterday, but we should sort of expect that. Yeah. Like, if it happened to Jesus, it's, we're not too good that it's not going to happen to us. Hey, stop being a negative Nancy, man. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Well, I mean, what do you, but I, 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 <laughs> right. but I mean, this is about being equipped, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. And it's about not ha- not being surprised. So are you saying being a disciple of Jesus is not easy? Like it's going to be hard well, no matter what. Well, he told us it would be hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but sometimes don't we listen? I mean, like, I don't know how many people that have been saved to a gospel that says, right. now I'm going to follow Jesus. My life's going to be My so life's going to be easier. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't mean wealth and prosperity. We're not saying that, but nope. my life's going to be easier now because I'm following yep. Jesus. Everything's fixed because I'm... Mm-hmm. And I find it's the opposite, usually. Let me ask you something. What what if you sense that the bite from a wolf is actually something that Jesus is doing to you? Is that possible? The reason I ask Mm. is when I read through the book of Acts, especially the story of Paul, Paul's call was, I'm going to send you to kings. You're going to preach the gospel to rulers. You're going to go all over the world and preach the gospel. And every one of us would raise our hands and be like, sign me up. I'll go. But then he also said, dude, you are going to get slammed. I mean, you're going to be brought before Mm -hmm. courts and you're going to be beaten and whipped. And if you look at the life of Paul, it's almost more painful than the life of Jesus, minus the crucifixion. (laughs) I mean, think about it. I mean, he was in prison. He got beat. Mm -hmm. He was shipwrecked. He got the 40 lashes minus one how many times? He got bit by a snake while... Yeah. So if, if I would experience those things, I'm like, man, these wolves, sheep, well, these wolves' teeth are sharp, mm. except Jesus told me this is what's going to happen to me. Mm. So what if part of God's sending for you is experiencing the bite of these wolves to some degree? I we- think it's interesting that you bring that up because I was just, when you mentioned verse one, okay, there's a, there's a phrase after two by two in every town. It says, in the places... Uh, into every town and places where he himself was about to go. And so when I read that just now, it was this idea of hope. Like he's sending me ahead knowing that he's going to come behind. And so no matter what I face, he's coming. Mm. So wherever, wherever I may feel a bite, wherever I may feel down, like Jesus is coming. And so there's that hope of like, uh, peace, restoration, even just like the helper. And so I don't know if that kind of speaks to what you're saying, but I think there's a, I don't know if I were the two, if I were the 72 sending out two by two, it'd be comforting knowing that Jesus was coming to the place where I was going to. So as what you're saying is an indication that Jesus is coming to where you are is if you get bit by wolves. Well, I don't know. I mean, if you're not getting I don't, bit. I, I don't necessarily think that's an absolute, but I, okay. I think that the thing that I think we're all like dancing around is we, when we're bit by a wolf, we're sharing the sufferings of Jesus Christ. And Philippians tells us we will. Mm. <laughs> and so, and the Philippians is one of the most joyous books in the entire New Testament. And yet it's still saying, hey, he suffered. This is how he suffered obedience to point of death. And this is the example that you have. Wow. So you need to be obedient to the point of death. And even if you get by, bit by wolves, I'm still there with you. Mm-hmm. And so God's present with us in that moment. So, so is that is... what you would say to encourage the people who feel like they're getting bit right now in ministry? Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe. Yeah. maybe. I mean, I mean, that's beautiful, John. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, think, I'm, I'm think, not no, saying it's it is. An absolute, but, like, I, but, but, but I, yeah, whether it's an absolute <laughs> or not, I, I, but, but to... <laughs> To invite people, I mean, I think that's one thing that, wow, I don't know that I've ever heard a sermon on that. Uh, maybe I have, 
or, or spin a someday. book. No, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I didn't hear it. Um, yeah. Is is hmm. well, what, what what John's talking about though is inviting people into the suffering mm. of Christ. Like that is that's rich, mm. and and knowing that like that's. What we're enduring with him? Sorry, am I too far away? Did we get a memo that I was not loud enough? I'm, not, I'm usually plenty loud. Um, and then, okay, how do we then help people look at it as I am, I am suffering with Christ for His kingdom in this moment? Well, isn't that better than suffering without purpose? Well, absolutely. I feel I mean, like that's, that's what, the greatest that's, purpose. Yeah, so yeah. that's the what changes. I it. totally agree because yeah. we're going to suffer one way or another. So why not suffer for the greatest purpose? Wow. I would. I would. I have a question that kind of goes along with this. So how do we know if, if we're a person who's suffering or who's being bitten, how do we know that we're suffering because of Christ or suffering because of our own stupidity? That's a great question. Because I think mm-hmm. sometimes there's choices that we make that oh, yeah. are, are not Jesus. I'm curious. Like, you what are you consequence for sin? Well, yeah, but just, I'm like, yeah. I'm curious. How do we know if we're, if we're facing a suffering, how do we know mm-hmm. what... So I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't think I've ever had peace when I'm stupid. Yeah, the Holy Spirit doesn't let you have peace. It doesn't let you stupid. have peace when you're stupid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, that's just, I mean, like, let's be honest. So I think the difference, there's a difference. Like, I've had moments of deep, intense suffering, emotional, physical, whatever. And there's a peace that washes over me. Mm. And I know in that moment that I, there's nothing that caused this except for whatever's going to happen, you know, whatever happens. Right. There was a moment um, a couple of years ago where I just, I kept coining the term. I said this to a few people. I said, I just had to sit in the pain for a while. And I hate sitting in the pain. Oh, my personality. I'm like, I want to deal with this conflict. Let's get it done. Yeah. Let's move on. And I was just sitting in it. But it was the first time in my entire life that I had peace because I knew that, that I had done everything that I possibly could have mm to remedy the situation. And I knew also that I couldn't do anything else. Like I was, the Holy Spirit was in me and that's all I, I mean, I couldn't have said anything else. I couldn't have acted a different way. Um, Hmm. And then he was present with me. And so Hmm. I think some of us don't want to sit and wait and we go to resolve because of other reasons, or even sometimes where we have justifiably been bit, but we move too fast and in moving too fast, we do something. You guys keep saying stupid, so I'm just going to say it. Do something <laughs> stupid to rush, to slow down the painful process yeah. of God's redemption and work in us. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I, my default answer to how do you know questions when it comes to the Bible <laughs> is by their fruit. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And, and so for you guys to label peace is brilliant, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, that's one of the fruits of the Spirit. So... You know, again, is what you're enduring producing any of those? Right. Mm. Right. If it's producing none of those, well, then it mm-hmm. might not be a wolf. Yeah. <laughs> it might just be you. But if you're if you're starting to experience some of the richness that comes with mm. the fruits of the spirit, yeah. that's probably a good gauge that yeah. you're suffering with mm. Christ. So <clears throat> I think athletes uh, know how to answer this question in terms of their athleticism well. So there's two kinds of pains and two kinds of pains in athleticism. There's the pain of of what comes from playing the sport when you're out of shape, mm. and pain that comes from playing the sport even though you are in shape. So if you're running, right, you might run uh, a track meet or a cross country meet, and you are in a ton of pain because you haven't been training or running, and your body's not used to it. And when that happens, everyone's like, "Dude, you should have trained better," right? <laughs> <laughs> and obviously that pain's come from you're not preparing. Yeah. But those who have been training and running and they put 110% on that track or that field, when they finish that race, mm-hmm. they are in incredible pain. However, nobody is like, that was stupid. That what, what they're saying is, my goodness, that was an incredible expression of athleticism. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the fruit of the spirit. It's, it's when you're living in this world, um, as a follower of Jesus, whether you're in business or even in ministry or teaching or finances or even parenting, I think there is a sense mm. of, okay, th- this pain is because I was acting kind of stupid and unprepared mm. and spiritually out of shape. Mm-hmm. Or this pain is actually because I'm following Jesus and this is a result of running hard for him. 
in that in that mm-hmm. environment. I was, I was and there's some got, relief in that, right? There's yeah, there's a peace, there's yeah. a joy that comes from yeah, because I was I was thinking like even just from a like running the race from like an empty tank versus an overflowing tank. Like there's a there's a certain point when you're you're overflowing and there's pain in the constant cycle of things coming in and out. But that feeling is different than running on an empty tank. I just got that like picture when you're talking about like running and you're you're gassed because you're not trained. Like you're you're striving for something. You're not operating like from something. That's and a good. So I think that's yeah. that might be a good gauge too. Paul says, consider it pure joy <laughs> when you face trials of many kinds, right? For you know that the testing of your faith, or we could probably insert bites from wolves, yeah, will produce perseverance. So mm-hmm. that's good. Can I move on to another question? I, I yeah. Okay. What happens if I say no? You're gonna um, do it anyway. Is this the lightning then I'll round? Let them ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me move on to the rejection part. Um, okay. th- that is an incredible pain when you feel rejected from mm. your ministry, especially if you're like evangelizing. You've been meeting with this person for a year at the same coffee shop every month, and it feels like you're just spinning your wheels. Mm. That's a rejection to me. Yeah. So how do you recover from a rejection when you are? working your tail off to serve the purposes of Jesus in the place that he has put you. How do you recover from rejection? I, I mean, my personal opinion is make sure that you've, you understand why you're doing it. Mm-hmm. I mean, what, why are you doing what you're doing? I think a lot of times we, mm-hmm. we take the rejection more personally when we're doing it for the wrong reasons. Wow. When it's, wow, I'm trying to check a box or man, mm-hmm. I, I'm, you know, I, I think it even go as far as, okay, how many, you know, I've, I've heard people say this. Well, how many people have you led to Jesus? Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. believe it or not, there's not a quota in here for my admittance into heaven. Now, that doesn't mean I shouldn't try. That's not, that's not my point here. But I think sometimes we actually look at our ministries and it's like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm, I'm creating points mm-hmm. yeah. in the kingdom. Mm-hmm. When no, we're all just gonna lay our crowns down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. so... Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if that answer actually answers your question, but I mean, like, I think that's, I think it's whose kingdom is it that you're trying to build and, and well, why? But there's, why? there's different types of rejection. So like when you're yeah. saying different, that whose kingdom are you trying to build? I, I, I don't think it's, I think you can be sorrowful about rejection without being personally beating yourself up. If that makes sense, sure, right? Because yeah. you can because, mourn for the loss. Because what I kept thinking is when you talked about, hey, we're giving peace. Mm-hmm. That's what that's the word you use from it's a what, verse five. Peace be to this house. You know, mm-hmm. say this. Mm-hmm. That's what you're giving. I kept thinking of all the people I know with a false peace Ooh. that I am saddened by, right. and I pray for, and I'm worried about, and I'm concerned about, to the point of probably almost sinfulness because I'm just going so far out of my way instead of just saying, okay, the Holy Spirit's got to do this. Hmm. And so there is a sense of that rejection being uh, either it's worldly sorrow. It's like, oh, I just got rejected. Me personally, I'm taking on this weight. Or is Jesus got the burden of, hey, this person needs him Hmm. and Mm. I get to be used. I'm excited about that to build his kingdom. But if it doesn't happen, it's not because I didn't I didn't do enough, mm-hmm. you know. Because I really think it's an achievement thing. The rejection, the reason we re- feel rejected is like, oh, I didn't achieve this. I didn't right. lead someone to Christ. Exactly. And the reality is, I don't think it's ever in our power to be able to do that. Right. I mean, that's if we're if we're if we're reading the Bible accurately, I have no power to do that. Eric on a Sunday morning preaching has no power to do that. You have mm-hmm. no power this last Sunday preaching to do that. If the Holy Spirit was here in this space, that's what does that. I think it's fascinating when you read the book of Acts, as soon as the disciples receive the promise of Jesus, right? The Holy Spirit, right. they start speaking in tongues. They do these incredible signs and wonders. That's what they say. And this massive crowd shows up. And after Peter preaches the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit, it does say that 3000 people were added to their number that day. But it also says, some people are like, dude, these people are just drunk. <laughs> so they experienced yeah, exactly. incredible rejection, yeah. didn't they? Instantly. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Instant so, rejection. And I think what you're saying is that the, 
the litmus test of success when we're serving Jesus' purpose in whatever place he's put us is not the results. It's more the faithfulness that we have shown mm. towards him. And yeah. we and so that's why I think Acts is clear. It says the Lord added to their number yeah. daily, those being saved, not them. Mm. It didn't say yeah. the disciples did it, right? That's right. So, that's yeah. right. But they had to be faithful, of course. So it's, the, it's that dance. Let me, let me move. I feel like I'm learning a lot here. This is, well, this is fun conversation. <laughs> well, it's unscripted. Uh, <laughs> let me move to... Um, um, the very last, one of the last things that you did. Uh, personally, I think the most impactful, compelling, and critical moment in your entire message was what you did towards the end when you posted the picture on the screen mm. of that fire hydrant surrounded by dead grass. I mean, dude, that visual spoke volumes. Yeah. How yeah. do we know if Brookside's doing that or not? <laughs> so let me ask you this. Is Brookside the grass or is Brookside the fire hydrant? I mean, I personally feel like Brookside's the fire hydrant. That's what I saw when I saw that picture. Is it Brookside's the fire hydrant? Um, you know, when I, when I look at the results of our church survey, when I look at, you know, how long people, you know, put in the survey that they've been a Christian and been attending church and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, it's like 90 some percent. Yeah. Well, that feels like a fire hydrant to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, are we that fire hydrant? I, that's a great question. That's what I'm asking people to wrestle with. Oh, um, you know, it. if, if I were to, I would, but I would make that charge to any church. That's not just yeah, Brookside. It's, yeah. it's, you know, when I, when I look at, hmm. you know, by and large, especially when you look in our environment, the churches that are growing are the new young suburban churches. Like those are the ones that are growing. Why? Well, and why are they growing? Well, mostly because people are leaving other churches to go to them. Like it's the new let's, fad on let's, the street. Let's be honest. Like that's sure. it's the consumerism. You, you mean Christianity? You mean faithfulness and obedience yeah. to Jesus Christ's call is not sexy? <laughs> <laughs> I think we just said that for oh, the last man. twenty minutes. <laughs> I'm I, I'm just I'm trying to summarize the whole conversation here. <laughs> You're it's doing a good not. job. <laughs> You're doing a really good job. But I mean, mm. I, but I think this is the I think this is the plight yeah. that, that we're currently in. And so mm -hmm. I think I think the challenge is, you know, okay. Brookside is this us, but not not just is Brookside is this us is is this is this you is this yeah. you where you yeah. are? Yeah. I, and when you put that picture up there, I got two images. One was a, a, a bird's eye view of Brookside and all the neighborhoods around it. I mean, yeah. Eric, you talk about it all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I look at I look at the Brookside as the fire hydrant, and then I want to see green mm -hmm. around. But if we talk to these neighbors on our parking lot. Do they feel that? Right. Do they still feel dead? Ooh. And if that if we talk to them and they still feel dead, then that's our answer. If our own neighbors can't sense the living water that's pouring out of this place, mm. then then that's where we as an organization need to start. But it's also in my home. So then I took a picture, a mental picture of my home and my street. Mm -hmm. Where where is the dead spots and where are the green <laughs> spots? I had, an, I had an interesting interaction with a neighbor that I just met. I've lived there three years. She lives like five houses down on the end. She was walking by and uh, I got to talking to her and, and her husband had passed away a few years ago. He was a pastor. They have five kids. We have five kids. We were talking about all these things. And she just said, you know, this is the Lord's street. And I was like, okay. <laughs> tell me more. And, and so like, I mean, <laughs> we had a, a good 10 minute conversation with this lady, but it was like, I didn't know that because I didn't, I didn't go five houses down to meet mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. And so it was eye opening to me to just say, okay, what does it look like for this to be the Lord's street? Cause I know not every house on the street is a green grass house. <laughs> <laughs> and so what does it take for me mm -hmm. to step in mm -hmm. to those places? And so I, I felt that challenge. I appreciated it. Just like you said, yep. that was a, that was yeah. really powerful, but I think that's a that's a way that helped me visualize even my mm -hmm. own neighborhood. Yeah, it reminded me of Jesus' promise of the Holy Spirit, and uh, living waters will pour out of yeah. you. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been we've been sent to our neighborhoods. I mean, uh, if anything, absolutely. if you're not a vocational in vocational ministry, right. your neighborhood is your ministry. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest; it's the people you're going to see the most. If you decide every time you see someone out in the yard, you wave, but then you park your car in the garage and shut the garage door as soon as possible and then walk into your house, yeah. you're missing out on opportunities. I, it made me think, I mean, the other day I spent an hour and a half in my front yard talking to a family yeah. near us and I'm thinking, 
I went over there and did not realize it was going to be an hour and a half. <laughs> and next thing I know, all my kids are over there playing uh, yeah, with their yeah, kids. Yeah. And I'm thinking, okay, this opportunity would have never happened if I hadn't walked across the street. And all I asked was, hey, I saw you digging up your yard. What were you guys doing the other week? All right. <laughs> Anyone can ask that question, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, and that's what started this long conversation. Nosy neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Complaining about weeds in your yard. I didn't complain about weeds. Or <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's only other people. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me wrap this up by asking one more question, and I'd love for all of you to respond to it. So if, if we have some listeners, not just on this podcast, but also from Sunday, uh, have begun to ask the question, all right, uh, I believe that because I'm a follower of Jesus, I am sent into the world. Hmm. Um, but I don't know how to start moving in that direction. Mm. What would you give them as one very practical, simple, and doable step that they can move towards the place Jesus is sending them? Whether it's in their home or whether it's in their career, or maybe for some it's like, he's calling me to full-time ministry. What's the best practical step? I, I think you gave a practical step. Well, I was, okay. Are you going to steal what I was just going to say? <laughs> I, think, I think we all I think we all were going to say the exact same thing. I, I thought you gave a practical step. I'll let you go. No, I no. I, I would, I, what, what, I was, what, I, what I was thinking is I, I wrote down all the testimony questions you had. Okay. And you can't live sent if you don't know how you came to know Jesus. You can't live sent if you haven't decided to follow him, right? That's a, that's mm -hmm. a, makes sense. Mm. Um, you can't live sent if you don't know what Jesus saved you from. Like, yeah. it's like, oh, I know Jesus. I grew up in the church. That, well, that's not what he saved you from. That I doesn't know. make sense. <laughs> yeah. um, and why do you want others to know Jesus like you? Mm -hmm. And I think that last question is the question most of us really struggle with as believers. And that's why we don't live sent. But, yeah. And so practically speaking, you have to answer that last question. But I don't know if that's what you were going to say. That actually wasn't what I was going to say. Nice. See? So I, I, I was going to say, learn to listen. Listen to who? Everybody. Okay. Well, we like learn to like, because mm. I mean, I, it, and I agree with you. Like, I don't know that I, if I were to rank these, like I think mm. testimonies probably know your story mm. is number one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think the thing that, you know, we, we, when we talk about evangelism, when we talk, we, we think unf right, wrong or indifferent, we think about, okay, the person on the street corner preaching as cars go by or, right? That, I mean, that's the kind of mental image that mm -hmm. kind of taints our Where's view a little bit. Where's your Luke? <laughs> I can use it if you want me to. Um, <laughs> and so, but, hmm. and, and, and what the world is on short supply of right now is people who are good listeners. Mm. Wow. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody has a voice. Mm -hmm. And every social media application will show you that everybody has a voice. Mm -hmm. And all the voices are equal value. Uh, yeah. Right. I'm not saying that's true. I'm oh, okay. Social media <laughs> I'm, like, I'm not sure how to... <laughs> I don't know if I should... I don't know if I'm supposed to No, I'm not saying that's not. true. I, you, were saying, you were saying on social media, everyone has a voice. I'm saying but, they all hold equal value. That's but, what social media would say. But, but ultimately, mm. like, if you really want to mix things up, you'll be an amazing listener and hear people's stories. Mm -hmm. And then they will trust you with their stories. Mm -hmm. And once they trust you with their stories, mm -hmm. their hearts are a little more open. Mm -hmm. so, so listen more than speak. I, I, amen. Okay. Listen so, way more, twice as much at least. Right. Two things I don't tell people, and this feeds yeah. into that. I don't tell people I'm a pastor unless they ask <laughs> specifically a specific question that I cannot lie to. Okay, <laughs> right? I'm not going to lie. Like, uh, I work in car sales. I, I'm not going to tell people that. Second thing is... Um, I don't even tell people I'm a Christian usually and it opens up spiritual conversations because you start listening and then people are like, well, this person cares about me. Yeah. And then they'll tell you stuff that you don't want to hear. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. You know, like you're like, whoa, oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. You know? I'm glad you trust me with that. So, yeah. But if you, but if you lead with something, yeah. people think either it's a you have an agenda. Or religious view or whatever. And so yep. many times it's the conversations I, I, I think lend the most like eternal significance tend to be the ones where you don't, broadcast who you are or what you do or what your background is and you entirely focus on them. And then when it gets to the point of like, hey, I see you have a problem and maybe I have a solution here. Mm -hmm. When you get there, that's when you tell your testimony. I think we tell our testimony before we listen. Mm -hmm. And that's really a struggle because I hear a lot yep. of people that know about Jesus and they've heard from this Christian guy down the street yep. or a Christian gal or whatever. Yeah. And, but they, they are like, but they never listen to mm -hmm. what I've been through. You know, recently I was talking with someone and it's just, this made me think of it when Luke or when Luke was talking and when Eric asked the question, I asked this person, 
um, why they weren't in church. And they know I'm a pastor at this point. And they proceeded to tell me one of the most horrifying stories of abuse I've ever heard, okay? And it's not like I haven't heard stories like this about the yeah. church. And it's not it's not Brookside. This is someone completely out in the community. I'm like, oh, wow. And it happened years ago. And I said, so why aren't you back? Mm. Ooh. Because, because I sense the person needs Jesus and I sense yep. they know Jesus. And I sense, and they were just like, I just, I just can't do it. Mm. No one's actually like, they were like, no one really listened to this story before you. Mm. And I was like, how many years has this been? And then it went in, it was over 10 years. And I was like, mm. well, I'm thankful that and honored that you would tell me this, mm. but I really would encourage you to be part of a church, any mm-hmm. church, you know? And, and so that's the hard part. So I still want you to answer the question. <laughs> He's got an um, answer. And then, was, and then I have one other thing. Mine was similar to yours, but not the same. Okay. Um, but I, I think we, um, we quickly uh, ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit when we're living sent, um, where I'm learning that delayed obedience is still disobedience because when he calls me to it, I need to do it. Like there's no, there's no thinking wait, wait, about can it. Can you say that? That's, that's pithy. I like that. When he calls me to it, I need to do it. Yes. Just, yeah. Yes. I love Rolls that. off the tongue. Because I, <laughs> I think like for me, in for me particularly, I am a processor. And so I can process myself out of actually being sent mm-hmm. because I'm looking at all of the things and I'm saying, well, if I do that, then I'm going to feel this way and it's going to make me look like this and I'm going to say this and I'm not good with social interactions that are uncomfortable and all these things. And so my encouragement, like, I mean, your last point is go do it. And I think that, I <laughs> that, think that's- That was a point? <laughs> that's, the, that's the last- that's number six. That's, yeah, it was. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but I think that's a huge hindrance to us living sent, at least for me, I'll speak for me. But like when I listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, when I know he has given me the power to do the thing he's called me to do, to live sent, when he prompts me, I need to just listen and do it right then. Mm. Because there's so many times, like last week, the walk with my family, I see a lady walking towards me and I'm like, I don't want to talk to her. But then David's, but then, David's being honest for the no, rest no, of us. But, but no, seriously, I, oh, I, I totally mean, agree. Literally, yeah. like my house is right here. I'm getting ready to turn. We're getting ready as a family to turn into our driveway, and she's still two houses down. And I just felt like the Holy Spirit was like, "This is why you went on a walk." Mm-hmm. And that was the most encouraging 10, 15 minutes of mm. my entire week. And so I think I'm learning to just listen mm-hmm. and do it. So literally the next step for somebody might be to take a step. Just take the step that, that right you feel prompted yeah. to take. And we talk ourselves out of living yeah. sin. Is that, I mean, that's yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, yeah that's good. What you got, Luke? Well, the only other thing I was going to say, it, just along the lines of listening, and this is just a personal pet peeve, so take it for what it will. This isn't necessarily biblical. Um, but it's a lot of times when we're listening to people, you'll hear people go, oh yeah, I've been there. Oh yeah, I've been there. That is my least favorite phrase. Mm. Oh, I've been through that. Maybe something like it, Mm. but not exactly that. Yeah. You may have lost a spouse. You may have lost a child. You may have had a miscarriage. You may have gone through financial ruin, like fill in the blank, Mm. but not exactly how they're experiencing it. That's good. I found myself saying like, yeah, I totally understand. And right. I'm like, and you're like, no, no, you, I don't. No, you don't. I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, I don't. No, you don't. I don't. <laughs> and, and and I think I think there's there's a blur between sympathize and empathize. Ooh, sympathize amen. is just I can understand it from based on right. what you're saying. I I've never experienced that. Yep. And empathy is I have experienced the very same thing. So when it says that Jesus can sympathize with us or empathize, right? He's actually empathizing. He suffered more than we ever could. Mm. So when we go to people and we say, you know. Yeah, I know that that's like we're actually demeaning the experience that they've had wow. of pain. Yep. And saying, "Oh, I've been through it and I'm on the other side, so you get a, pull up yeah, your bootstraps and do it. It's, it's all, all fine. It's all end. fine. Right. I'll work out yeah. in the end." And and I I think you know why we do that? Do, do you Mostly think for self-promotion? 
I, we're not comfortable sitting in the pain. Oh. Yeah. I was going back to that. You see that? Oh, that's good. Why do well, I feel like I'm just a puppet in this? <laughs> you haven't figured that out yet? That's always been the case. It, it so. took me a while. Thanks, well, Eric. This might be a good time to uh, wrap it up before it devolves so. into something that's <laughs> worse. So, uh, Luke, thank you so much for being with us. I've and enjoyed always, it. John, you guys David, are a blessing. appreciate you being here. And thank you for joining us as well. Again, we hope that if this found, uh, if you found value in this, that you would take the step and uh, subscribe to it, like the channel, and then share it on your social media platforms. We can't wait to have more conversation next week with you. And uh, until then, have a great day, and we'll see you then.